Hey guys, today we're in the book of Numbers chapter 32. So we ended yesterday with Israel going and bringing vengeance on the Midianites in Moab. And so we pick up right after that today, uh, and where in verse 5 it says, uh, And they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants for a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. So here they destroy the Midianites in Moab. They come back to Shatim, the place across from Jericho, and they see this place that is now known as Galid. Um, very hilly country, tall grass. It's a beautiful place. Um, rains a lot. It's a great place for livestock. And so here we see two tribes come back and they say, um, Hey Moses, we really like it here. If we have found favor, if you think we've done a good job in defeating the Midianites uh, in Moab, if we've helped you enough, allow us to stay here. Allow the tribe of Reuben and Gad to stay here on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And it even says in verse 5, do not take us across the Jordan. Now, I know for many of us at Green Acres, we, we just did Joshua in the beginning of the year. And so you might understand this a little better. But even though we've studied it, I still have so many questions. Why would anybody not want to go across the Jordan River? You've got to think about what we have been reading, right? Since... Joseph, really since Jacob, right? Jacob has 12 sons. God says, you're going to be Israel. You're going to be the ones who will receive the land, the promised land that I promised Abraham. And ever since that Jacob and his sons went to Egypt where Joseph was, and for 400 years they become slaves, and you have to imagine every generation is thinking, we're the generation that's going to be rescued. We're the generation that God's going to take us to the promised land, to the land that's flowing with milk and honey, right? That, that's kind of been their hope that they're holding on to every single generation. 400 years later, God hears their cries. He rescues them in a mighty act uh, of bringing them out of Egypt, taking them to Mount Sinai, hearing the voice of God, seeing God on the mountain, watching God lead them down daily by a pillar of fire and smoke, worshiping God in the tabernacle, bringing them up to the promised land in which they did not have enough faith. They thought that the giants were bigger than God. And then God wipes them out. And now a new generation is standing literally at the border of the promised land. They can see the promised land. I'm telling you, it is... I, I can almost hit a golf ball, okay? Uh, not really. Um, but it's, it's just a mile or two away, right? They can easily see the Jordan River. They can easily see Jericho. They can see what would be Jerusalem up on a hill. They are that close to the promised land. And here, Reuben and Gad say, I know that we've done all this, but it's good enough for us. Oh, I have so many questions that really scripture doesn't answer. Why would you say that? But as a pastor, as somebody who spent a lot of his life in church, I think I see the exact same people who walk with God who have gone through valleys, who have gone on mountains, who've gone into battles, who've come out, they've walked with God and they tell God, God, this is far enough. And God says, no, I have something better for you just over the Jordan. And they say, no, thanks. This is good enough. Oh, this chapter truly hurts my soul to read it. But Reuben and Gad say, hey, this is enough. And so when you think about it, they're saying, this is so good that this is better than what God's going to provide in the promised land. Oh, 
just hurts, just hurts to read this chapter. And so what happens? Moses gets a flashback is really what happens. Moses has a flashback. He's been here before, right? Remember we read and he sent spies into the land and 10 of the spies come back and they said, no, we can't do this. We can't cross over. And those 10 spies talked all of Israel out of going, even though there were two spies, Joshua and Caleb says, hey, it's good. And now they're on the border. And once again, he has a group of people saying, hey, I don't want to go into the promised land. Moses has a flashback. And we get to see this flashback that's taking place here. He says, why will you discourage the heart of the people? Why would you say that? We're on the border. Israel's ready to go. Don't discourage them. Why would you say this? Your fathers did this. Your fathers, the people, their forefathers 38 years ago talked Israel out of going over into the promised land and they all died. Moses is saying, don't you realize God will do that to you? Don't make the same mistake that your fathers have done. Don't discourage, verse 9, the heart of the people from Israel from going into the Lamb. And he says, he killed them all because they did not wholly follow God, verse 11. And he even goes on, and uh, the Lord's anger was kindled against them. He's explaining the story. Verse 14, he says, Behold, you have risen in your father's place a brood of sinful men to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. Here, Moses says, You broodful, uh, you brood of sinful men, or your brood of serpents. This is the kind of the same words that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 12, right? He's getting at what what are you doing? We, God has brought us here again, and you're doing the same identical thing. You don't have faith. And he says, God will destroy you in verse 15. But in verse 16, we see the true hearts of Reuben and Gad. I don't, we see their true hearts. I still don't understand their hearts. Okay. So it says, um, he says, we've come near, we will build sheep hoods and livestock and cities for our little ones, but we will take up arms ready to go before the people of Israel until they have bought for them a place. Uh, Reuben and Gad, the people of these two tribes say, hey, whoa, 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 Moses, Moses, we have faith in God. We want to stay here, but we will cross the river with you. Our women and our children will stay here. We need to build them cities first because there's still a lot of enemies around. So while we're gone, they need to be protected. But we will pick up, we will pick up the swords and the spears and we will lead all of the other 10 tribes across the Jordan. And we will be basically what we would call today the front lines of the battlefield. We don't want to go in the promised land, but we know and we trust God and in his faithfulness. And so we will lead this, right? So he's, he's soothing Moses' flashback, right? And he says, we will not return to our homes until each of the people of Israel has gained his inheritance. In verse 20, so Moses said to them, if you will do this, you will see this over and over again. Moses uses this word, if. Okay, if you keep your promise, uh, it's okay. We'll, we'll let you come back here. And then he says, but if you will not, if you break your promise, notice what it says, be sure your sin will find you out. In the Hebrew, it's, it's a, it it's uses a language of, um, of, of an, uh, an action. And it, it paints a picture that sin is active, will be actively looking and pursuing them to take them out. So if you break your word, Reuben and Gad, your sin will actively seek you and it will destroy you. And so Moses gave a command to all of Israel, to the other 10 tribes. And in verse 29, notice it says, if, if, notice that, if the people of Gad and Reuben carry out their promise, then you shall give them the land of Galid. However, verse 30, if they don't keep their promise... Uh, then the, um, 
Uh, we will pass over arm before the Lord and the possession of inheritance shall remain with us beyond the Jordan, right? So you get this if in this if. Moses, if they keep their promise, it's good. If they don't, don't, don't let them do it, right? And Moses gave it to them, to the people of Gad, to the people of Reuben. And now here in verse 33, we see the half tribe of Manasseh. Now we know because we've read Joshua uh, those of us in Green Acres, we read Joshua that on the east side of the Jordan, it was Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Here, we don't see that until verse 33. It's been Reuben and Gad, and now the half-tribe of Manasseh. And honestly, we don't have in the Bible why uh, the tribe of Manasseh broke into half. Okay, We don't understand why half of them will be in the promised land, half of them will be on the other side. We, we, we don't know. It's a question when we get to heaven, right? Um, but maybe verse 40 helps us out here. It says, And Moses gave Galeed to Makar, the son of Manasseh. Maybe uh, that in the Reuben and Gad going up in their building, Makar and his descendants says, Hey, this is pretty nice. And they joined. And because they took over land, because they started to build, they just said, Hey, yeah, throw us in with Reuben and Gad. We don't know. doesn't really matter. We'll ask Jesus when we get there. Um, but that's the question. So here you would say, man, this is an interesting story, but where is Jesus? Well, simply, uh, where's Jesus in your life? A lot of people walk up to the, to the river of the Jordan. They walk up to salvation and they say, you know what? This is good enough for me. Church attendance is good enough for me. Seeing the grace of God is good enough for me. Hearing the blessings that God will give, that'll be good enough for me. But they never fully want to go over and trust God in the blessings. The question is, do you trust God with not only your future, but do you trust Him with your present? And, and I think that's where the story is. Reuben and Gad, they trusted him with the future, but they wanted their kids and their women to stay because they were unsure about the present. Do you trust Jesus to save you for heaven? A lot of people will say yes, but if you don't trust him with today, what good is he to trust you in the future, right? You have to trust him today and tomorrow and in the future. Hope that makes a little bit more sense, and we'll see you tomorrow in chapter 33. God bless.